Chapter 2.3, Process. 2.3.1, Four Phases of Grounded Theory Development. This section summarizes the interpretist approach to grounded theory that was used for this thesis, as outlined by Corbin and Strauss in their book, Basics of Qualitative Research, Techniques and Procedures for Developing Grounded Theory. The methodology consists of four general phases illustrated in figure four below. The first phase is data collection. Once enough raw data has been collected for analysis, the second phase is data coding. Once enough data has been coded and categorized, the next phase is theoretical sampling. These three phases repeat in a cyclical, continuous pattern until reaching a point called theoretical saturation, at which point the final theory is assembled. Reference 38. And then you have figure four, reference 33. The four phases of grounded theory development. 2.3.2, phase one, data collection. The grounded theory approach relies heavily on constant comparative analysis of collected data. Using the constant com comparative method, a researcher continuously moves back and forth between data collection and data analysis in an iterative manner, asking a series of questions designed to encourage inductive reasoning and lead to the development of new theory regarding some phenomenon. The continuous generative questioning of data more colloquially known as pulling threads, leads the researcher through multiple iterations of data collection, data coding, and theoretical sampling. This helps the re researcher identify what data to be collected and analyzed. Reference 38. One of the biggest advantages of grounded theory methodology is that it allows for a researcher to comb through highly diverse and unconventional sources of data, included but not limited to videos, documents, drawings, diaries, group meetings, memoirs, news articles, opinion pieces, historical documents, biographies, books, journals, technical papers, non-technical papers, and studies. Grounded theory researchers can use one or several of these sources in combination with other Depend, others dependent on what they're investigating. Reference 38. Data diversity is especially helpful when researching a field of technology as novel as Bitcoin, because much of the latest and most informed subject matter related to this technology comes from informal sources. The Bitcoin white paper, for example, was published via a private mailing list rather than through academic journals. Likewise, the first operational proof-of-work software was circulated amongst a largely anonymous online community of cypherpunks for years before the idea of proof-of-work was first discussed in formal academic literature. Moreover, this subject matter is still new, controversial, diverse, and has yet to arrive at academic, professional, or legal consensus surrounding it making it virtually impossible to define what constitutes an informed source of information. References 38 and 39. The primary source of data collected was technical literature and non-technical literature. Technical literature consisted of scientific research papers, research reports, theoretical papers, philosophical papers, and other sources of information characteristic of professional and disciplinary writing. These primary data were mostly sought, sourced from the author's academic studies and research. The author was enrolled in MIT's system design and management curriculum and took several graduate elective classes like systems security and software engineering to support this research endeavor. Non-technical literature was also used as supplemental data. These data included books, letters, biographies, diaries, 
reports, videos, memoirs, news articles, catalogs, memoirs, memos, sorry, scientific and otherwise, and a variety of other materials. Reference 38. 2.3.3, phase two, data coding. Data coding is a process where a researcher engages in a process of quantitative microanalysis interpretation and conceptual abstraction by assigning concepts, aka codes, to singular incidences of data. Concepts are words or phrases used by the analyst, the analyst to stand for the interpreted meaning of a given incidence of data. After enough data has been coded, a grounded theory researcher engages in a process of conceptual ordering where concepts are organized into discrete categories according to their properties, i.e. characteristics that define, give specificity, specificity, and differentiate one concept from another, and dimensions, i.e. the range over which a conceptual property can vary, references 40 and 38. Quantitative microanalysis of data involves careful consideration and interpretation of meaning. Every concept represents a researcher's own subjective understanding of the meaning implicit in the words and actions of participants. To, to arrive at meaning, an analyst will brainstorm, make constant comparisons, try out multiple different ideas, eliminate some interpretations in favor of others, and expand upon others before finally arriving at a final interpretation. This is designed to be a productive process which can generate multiple meanings of the same event, object, or experience. The goal is to open minds to new points of view and to illuminate other people's experience through the context of different fields of knowledge. This cross-pollination of different ideas and careful consideration of interpretation gives people a way to explain things which might not otherwise be easy to recognize or understand within a given theoretical framework, particularly the ones that are considered more popular or conventional. Reference 38. As Corbin explains, quantitative microanalysis of data's of interpreted meaning is useful because it enables people to think differently about things and uncover new, unconventional insights which might otherwise go undetected. Novel theories often arrive at conclusions that go against conventional wisdom because researchers were careful observers of detail that kept an open and exploratory mindset about what they observed. Reference 38. Corbin cites an explanation of this phenomenon by social economist William Beveridge. New knowledge very often has its origins in some quite unexpected observation or chance occurrence arising during an investigation. Interpreting the clue and realizing its significance required knowledge without fixed ideas, imagination, scientific taste, and a habit of contemplating all unexplained observations. In reading of scientific discoveries, one is sometimes struck by the simple and apparently easy observations which have given rise to great and far-reaching discoveries making scientists famous. But in retrospect, we see the discovery with its significance established. Originally, the discovery usually has no intrinsic significance. The discoverer gives it significance by relating it to other knowledge and perhaps by using it to derive further knowledge. Reference 38. The basic level concepts generated from data coding create the foundation of a grounded theory. Concepts are organized in varying levels of abstraction into categories based on their themes, properties, and dimensions. Categories provide the framework or skeleton of a grounded theory, which gives it greater explanatory power. Categories themselves can be further organized into higher levels of abstraction according to their properties and dimensions to create what are known as core categories. 
Core categories form the backbone of a theory. They represent what a researcher has determined to be the main theme of the data. Core categories are comprised of broad, holistic, and abstract concepts. When a grounded theory is finalized, it is usually ordered, assembled, and presented according to its core categories. Reference 38. Figure 5 provides an illustration of how a grounded theory is constructed. Researchers engage in data collection and data coding to develop basic level concepts, then use inductive reasoning to generate more generalized and abstract categories. Core categories serve as the highest level abstractions of the theory. When a researcher presents the core categories of their grounded theory to an audience, the word grounded serves as a reminder that each core category is grounded to basic level concepts that were developed after quantitative microanalysis of and interpretation of coded data. Here you have figure five, general construction of a grounded theory, reference 33. 2.3.4, phase three, theoretical sampling. The goal of generating a new theoretical framework is to create a foundation for explaining phenomena and for providing concepts and hypotheses for subsequent research. As Corbin and Strauss explain, at the heart of theorizing lies the interplay between researcher and data out of which concepts are identified, developed in terms of their properties and dimensions, and integrated around a core category through statements denoting the relationships between them all. Reference 38. Theories can range from substant substantive, middle range, or formal, depending on how specific, broad, and dense they are. For this thesis, the author endeavored to create a formal theory. Formal theories are the broadest and most dense kind of theory, used to understand a wider range of social concerns or problems. Constructing a formal theory requires an idea to be explored fully and considered from multiple different angles or perspectives. To aid in this process, researchers utilize analytical tools like diagrams, visual devices that depict relationships between analytical concepts and memos, written records of analysis. Diagrams and memos represent more than just repositories of analysis, but a form of analysis in and of itself where a researcher can form a dialogue with their data to move their analysis further. An example of a diagram generated during the author's data coding effort is shown in figure 6, reference 38. Figure 6, conceptual diagram generated during data coding. When performing data analysis, Corbin and Strauss explain that researchers must constantly interact with data by examining it, making comparisons, asking questions, coming up with new concepts to stand for meaning, and suggesting possible relationships between different concepts. These activities create a dialogue in the mind of a researcher that can be captured in diagrams and memos, allowing the researcher to brainstorm and let loose their thoughts. In the beginning, memos and diagrams are rudimentary representations of thought. But as research progresses, they grow in complexity, density, clarity, and accuracy, and serve as a useful tool for keeping track of the complex and cumulative thought processes which go into detail qualitative analysis, into detailed qualitative analysis. Memos and diagrams provide functional utility because they serve as a method for opening data exploration, identifying or developing the properties and dimensions of concepts, asking questions, exploring relationships, and developing the theory's overall storyline. Reference 38. As the properties and dimensions of different concepts and categories become more developed, 
grounded theory researchers transition into more targeted approach into a more tar- targeted approach to data collection and coding known as theoretical sampling. Theoretical sampling is a method of data collection which is based on concepts derived from previously collected and coded data as opposed to early phase data collection which is not collected based on concepts. In other words, theoretical sampling is a method of data collection which enables a researcher to follow up or close the loop on specific concepts that are interpreted from previous data coding. The purpose of theoretical sampling is to collect additional data from people, places, and events that maximize the researcher's opportunities to develop concepts in terms of their properties and dimensions, identify relationships between concepts, and and uncover different variations of the same concept. Reference 38. During theoretical sampling, data is scrutinized for tensions, ambiguities, contradictions, and conflicting codes, as these suggest the need for further data collection and analysis to help resolve the dissonance. This creates a cyclical process where the researcher stays locked in a loop of constant data collection, data analysis, quantitative microanalysis, and interpretation of meaning, memorizing, diagram drawing, and further theoretical sampling. The researcher remains in this cyclical process until they reach theoretical saturation, the point where no new concepts emerge from coded data and where all existing concepts that have been have been fully explored in terms of their properties and dimensions and the properties and dimensional variation upon recent upon reaching saturation the researcher can move to the final phase of grounded theory methodology reference 38 chapter 2.3.5 phase 4 theory formation Once theoretical saturation has been achieved, the final phase of a grounded theory effort is the integration and write-up of the theory itself, a process where formulated categories are linked together via core categories to form the overall theme of the theory. Integration is essential for creating a holistic view of underlying concepts, as concepts alone don't make a theory. Categories must be linked together and filled with conceptual detail to construct the dense and explanatory theory that represents more than just the sum of different categories. Core categories often have the greatest explanatory power because they expose the common thread relating different concepts together in new and interesting ways. If chosen correctly, Core categories create the mind-blown effect of a novel theory where interest in facts or enlightening information link together in new ways to create a sense of surprise or excitement. Reference 38. Figure 7 provides a breakdown of core categories identified by the author. These core concepts were identified based on the most commonly reoccurring concepts coded after achieving theoretical saturation. The central core category of this grounded theory is power projection. Every other core category presented in this theory is centered around power projection. The theory begins with an exploration of power projection tactics in nature and explores subcategories of basic level concepts related to power-based resource control, principles of survivorship, and inter-slash-intra-species power competitions. These concepts create the foundational understanding needed to explore the next core category of human power projection tactics. From here, the theory dives deep into subcategories of concepts related to abstract power projection tactics and physical power projection tactics employed by modern agrarian human societies. These concepts create the foundational understanding 
needed to explore the final core category of power projection tactics in cyberspace. From here, the theory dives deep into a subcategory of concepts related to abstract power projection tactics in, from, and through cyberspace. This lays the groundwork for understanding Bitcoin not as a monetary technology, but as a potentially new form of software instantiated physical power projection technology, which the author encapsulates with the neolo neologism software. Then you have figure seven, core categories chosen for this research effort. With these core categories identified, the author assembled the most relevant conceptual memos under each core category to form the final integrated theory. The theory itself is simply a collection of conceptual memos written by the author throughout the duration of the data collection and analysis effort, analysis effort which expand on the basic level concepts that were interpreted during coding. It should be noted that the final integrated theory only includes categories and concepts that were most relevant to the core categories, which were not known prior to da data collection and analysis. In other words, what the reader sees as the final deliverable of this research endeavor represents only a fraction of the concepts explored throughout the duration of quantitative microanalysis. The author's job was to effectively discover all the dead end ideas or clues in pursuit of finding a new common thread linking different concepts together in a previously undetected way. The novel theory presented to the public as the final deliverable represents a small tip of a much larger iceberg of concepts analyzed throughout the formation of the theory. By linking all these diverse concepts together under the same core categories centered on power projection, the reader is, hopefully, able to gain a new profound appreciation for the potential socio-technical and national strategic implications of proof-of-work protocols like Bitcoin that expands beyond the boundaries of the current theoretical frameworks that are being used to analyze this technology. The theory incorporates multiple different fields of knowledge together in novel and hopefully interesting ways that highlight a way that highlights how this technology could have broader implications than what is currently being addressed using singular frameworks like financial, monetary, or economic theory. Chapter 2.4, Disadvantages and Advantages. Experience without theory is blind, but theory without experience is mere intellectual play. Immanuel Kant Reference 41, Chapter 2.4.1, Four Commonly Cited Disadvantages of Grounded Theory. Many formal studies and papers have discussed the advantages and disadvantages of grounded theory. What follows is a summary of those which stood out to the author based off his experience completing this thesis, starting with four disadvantages and concluding with three advantages. As previously discussed, the most cited disadvantage of grounded theory is that interpretations and findings are vulnerable to intrusion of perspectives, biases, and assumptions. There are strategies that can be used to highlight and mitigate these intrusions, but it certainly appears to be a valid criticism. However, it's important to the reader to understand that subjectivity of interpretation is often not considered to be a bad thing in qualitative research like this like it is with quantitative research, because different interpretations lead to the formation of new knowledge. People like hearing diverse and unique perspectives on issues that are important to them. And subjectivity of interpretation is precisely what provides these unique perspectives. 
A second commonly cited disadvantage of grounded theory is that it doesn't provide objective results. This appears to be another form of general discontent with qualitative research. Corbin and Strauss argue that it is not possible for qualitative research to have objective results and assert that researchers should instead aim for sensitivity rather than objectivity. In their words, data collection and analysis have traditionally called for objectivity. Today, it is acknowledged that objectivity, as it is traditionally defined in research, can't be applied to qualitative research. The reason is that qualitative researchers interface with participants and the data. They bring with them their perspectives, training, knowledge, assumptions, and biases, which in turn influence how they interact with participants and interpret data. Instead of objectivity, qualitative researchers aim for sensitivity or the ability to carefully listen and respect both participants and the data they provide. Reference 38. A third commonly cited disadvantage of grounded theory is that the presentation of research findings is not straightforward. Reference 42. This is perhaps a reflection of how difficult it can be to categorize concepts and their interrelationships, which is something that the author certainly struggled with. Finally, a fourth commonly cited disadvantage of grounded theory is that it's time consuming and difficult to conduct. To this criticism, the author would wholeheartedly agree. Chapter 2.4.2, four commonly cited advantages of grounded theory. One of the most commonly cited advantages of grounded theory is that it help is that it's helpful for developing new understandings of complex phenomena that can't be explained using existing theories or paradigms. Qualitative research is in general is good for exploring areas that have not yet been thoroughly researched because they are flexible and allow for researchers to search and discover relevant variables that can later be tested through quantitative forms of research. Theoretical explanations can be developed that reach beyond the known or beyond what humanity is currently capable of measuring, offering new insights into a variety of experiences and phenomena that should be explored in the future. It is not uncommon for a theory to be developed in one person's lifetime. Only for it to be confirmed several lifetimes later using quantitative forms of research when the right measuring tools or techniques eventually become available. References 42 and 38. This is especially true for theories related to computer science as the first series related to general purpose computing. Not to mention the first published computer program preceded operational general purpose computers by more than a century. In other words, the first computer programs were nothing but theories. What we now call computer science was founded by theorists and is still dominated by theorists. Sometimes the only option is for people to theorize until the means or resources to perform more rigorous quantitative analysis becomes available, and it should go without saying that every quantitative analysis of underlying hypothesis of an underlying hypothesis requires a theoretical framework from which to derive a hypothesis in the first place. Without dreamers coming up with theories, there would be no hypotheses to validate using quantitative analysis. A second commonly cited advantage of grounded theory is that it creates a systematic and rigorous process for data collection and analysis, enabling researchers to study phenomena with, great, with a greater level of depth. The author found this structure to be especially useful since he didn't have previous experience using qualitative research methodologies, references 42 and 38. A third advantage of grounded theory qualitative research is also good for taking a holistic 
and comprehensive approach to the study of phenomena because they can incorporate multiple different theoretical frameworks. General concepts can be identified and theoretical explanations can be developed that reach beyond what is currently known. This helps people give new meaning to what they encounter in their lives and perhaps make more sense of it, giving individuals and groups the ability to make sensible plans of action for managing problems. Hence the methodology's popularity for public policy making. Reference 38. Chapter 2.5 Lessons Learned Without the making of theories, I am convinced there would be no observation. Charles Darwin, reference 43. Overall, the author was satisfied with the grounded theory methodology, particularly the interpretivist approach used for this research effort. The experience turned out to be far more intellectually demanding, thus satisfying, than expected. It was nice to have the flexibility to dive into diverse fields of knowledge in pursuit of underlying clues or concepts that could resolve some conflict, ambiguity, or dissonance that emerged in the analyzed data. It was extremely exciting to discover a concept that linked two completely different fields of knowledge together in unexpected ways. Being able to use a variety, a wide variety of diverse and unconventional data sources proved to be a critical enabling factor for this research effort, particularly during the theoretical sampling phase. It's hard to imagine that a detailed analysis of Bitcoin could be done without incorporating unconventional data sources, as it is still very new and formal literature on the subject is quite scarce. For anyone considering grounded theory in the future, the author offers three lessons learned. The first lesson learned about this methodology is that it can take the researcher far outside of their academic background and create a steep cognitive switching penalty. The author spent most, most of his time digging through technical literature that has nothing to do with his academic background. This is both a time-consuming and mentally exhausting process because it requires the researcher to essentially teach themselves the basic principles of multiple different fields of knowledge to establish a general understanding of each field and be able to relate similar concepts from different fields together under the same theoretical categories. The, the author found it easy to dive deep into very narrow fields of knowledge to increase depth of understanding for each topic, but much harder to increase breadth of knowledge by diving into multiple narrow fields. There was a notable cognitive switch in penalty when performing research because of having to switch attention between different fields of knowledge and their associated contexts, e.g. switching from papers about computer science, to biology, to anthropology, etc. The upside, of course, is that doing deep dives into diverse topics is intellectually satisfying. Far more than any other research the author has done in both his professional and academic capacity. A second lesson learned about this methodology is that it's surprisingly frightening. Throughout most of the data collection and analyst process, an analysis process, the researcher does not know what the final theory is going to look like, how it's going to be perceived, or even if it's valid. Because much of the interpreted qualitative data is subjective, there is no satisfactory feeling of being right, like there is with the objective analysis of highly quantitative data sets. Additionally, unlike the traditional hypothesis deductive approach where a researcher can choose a research question and formulate a hypothesis in such a way that is virtually guaranteed to have an interest in results, to have interest in results regardless of whether the hypothesis is validated or invalidated. A grounded theory approach is far more open-ended, unstructured, and uncertain. The researcher 
doesn't get the comfort of feeling as though their research effort is going to lead to the formulation of a meaningful and interesting theory until the very end of the analytical effort, long after most of the work has been done and all the pieces of the theory are integrated together. It takes high risk tolerance and comfort with uncertainty to put so much effort into something without having a clear idea about what the end state will look like. Along the way, grounded theory can be disheartening because the analytical process requires a lot of experimentation with, with different interpretations and categories, creating many conceptual dead ends. Additionally, the author never felt a sensation of being done with the analysis like he did using the traditional scientific method on previous research efforts. Even after achieving theoretical saturation, there always seemed to be more concepts, properties, or dimensions to uncover. It was impossible for the author to feel like he had reached the so-called bottom of the rabbit hole. I mean, that's just exciting for the potential of Bitcoin. A third lesson learned about this methodology is that it is far more time consuming than expected. Despite being explicitly warned that grounded theory is often harder and more time consuming. Coding data, drawing diagrams, and writing memos is extremely time intensive, especially when it's related to technical literature surrounding complex topics with lots of semantic ambiguity and jargon like computer science it takes a lot of time digging to discover the right data needed for theoretical sampling most of the author's time was spent learning that interpretations not to make what interpretations not to make what categories not to use and what not to include in the theory. It was a challenge to sort through thousands of pages of technical and non-technical literature, interpret them, and link them together via conceptual relationships. It was even harder to identify what categories to use, and it could be very disheartening when an exciting candidate category turned out to be a dead end causing the author to have to return to square one or even rework or redo major parts of the theory. Moreover, the struggle to find the right categorizations is undetectable by the reader because all they see at the end of the effort are the precious few categorizations which survived a rigorous down selection process. This creates a tip of the iceberg phenomenon where the gro final grounded theory represents a tiny sample of the concepts collected and categories explored throughout the development of the theory. What did you leave out, Jason? As a final thought about grounded theory, it's worth echoing what Corbin and Strauss summarized as the characteristics of people who are attracted to qualitative research. This methodology is for people with a humanistic bent who are curious about people and how they behave. It is for those who are creative and imaginative, but have a strong sense of logic. It's for those who are detail oriented, who can recognize variation as well as regularity in the data they analyze. To succeed at grounded theory, a researcher needs to be willing to take risks and live with ambiguity. Reference 38.